Gracious God in heaven, thank you so much for another week and that the Sabbath is here. We realize it's more than half over already, and, but here we are to study together, to learn, to focus upon you. Send your Holy Spirit to be in our hearts, inspire us, and teach us things that in our humanity we cannot learn. We're starting a new quarter, it's a new theme, a new lesson. Help us to set a firm foundation today that we can continue to build on. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Just a word of warning for those of you that are new. Um, there's different types of teachers that you'll find in your Sabbath school classes. One is where they don't remember what the lesson's about, they just talk. Another is they review the lesson as though you hadn't studied in your board. And then there's me. I assume you've studied your lesson, and we will build on that and go from there. So um, take your quarterly, turn to Friday. You always start at the end, right? A lot of people like to read the last chapter of the Bible first, or the last chapter of any book first, and then uh, they know whether they want to read the rest of it or not. The very last paragraph on Friday. God created us in his own image so that a loving relationship could exist between him and us. Although the entrance of sin shattered the original union, God seeks to restore this relationship through the plan of redemption. Life for us as dependent creatures takes on true meaning and clarity only when we enter into union with our Creator. Now I want to read the last sentence again. I'm going to stick another word in there that they had used earlier in the sentence. Life for us as dependent creatures takes on true meaning and clarity only when we enter into dependent union or submissive union with our Creator. Isn't that true? The union has to be one on our part as dependence upon Him or submissiveness, or I should say, and submissiveness in our union with Him. There is no other union with Christ or with God that works. Now remember, whether I use the word law or principle, I'm talking about the principles of how God's government works. You know, the Ten Commandments are written laws that describe the principles behind them. So the principles that guide the relationship between us and God are divine principles. He created those. That's how life was designed to work. And nothing else works properly. Satan tried to come up with other principles. We see how that's turning out. So for us, we have to look at God and our relationship with Him as a relationship that is based purely on His methods. When we try to inject our methods, we destroy it. Hmm. So, where do we go with that in this whole thing? Uh, take your Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 1. Now, I may not write most of this on the board just because it takes too long but we have a clear history here that is done. Moses wrote it in a very interesting way. To begin with, let's put it this way. Genesis chapter 1 through chapter 2 verse 3 is an overview of the full week of creation. Chapter 1 through 2 verse 3. I wish the chapter broke there. <laughs> um, 
So we have an overview that just, just real short in a nutshell gives you the whole story, the, the overview of the story. Then in chapter 2, verse 4 and following, there's different sections that are amplified. So we want to look at some of that. But first of all, verse 1, what does it say? In the beginning, who? God. Isn't it interesting how simple God starts things? Uh, the book of John, I love the way that book starts too. In the beginning was the Word. Who's that? And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Kind of like what we've got right here. In the beginning, God, what? Created. What? There it is. There's your three parts. You have the, the when, the who, and what he did. And then, of course, we have the various parts of the week. That's not our focus today. Verse 26. Then God said, let, what's the next word? Singular or plural? Plural. Interesting. By the way, every time it says God in chapter 1, it's plural. The word God is plural. We don't see that. We don't have words that say that. We've even destroyed the old English with our new of you. You know, today, that's you and that's you. So now how do I know how many is in the you? Now, I'll give you this ahead of time because we're going to come to it eventually. If you read the King James Version, and that would be the one I would recommend, honestly, uh, when you see these and thous and so on, and ye and what are some of the others? Anyway, here's, here's how you do it. It's very simple. It took me years to figure it out. If the word starts with a T, that's one. If it starts this way, it's two. Here's two here, there's one here. You can remember it that way. All right? These, thou, those are all singular. In the New King James and all of your modern translations, it changes it all to you. And you don't know if it's singular or plural. And there's a spot in this chapter that is interesting. Then God said, let us make man in our image. Now, what is the image of God? In what way were we made in the image of God? Well, I'll let you hold on that. Before we get done, you'll answer that. All right? According to our... Likeness. Well, that's the same idea as our image, isn't it? Our likeness, our image. So he said the same thing twice, really, what he did. And then it goes on. Uh, Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So everything that moves, they were to have dominion over. So God created man in his own image. That's three times. And in the image of God, he created them. That's four times. If God says something four times, back to back to back to back, wouldn't you expect he'd explain what that is? You, you kind of think so, wouldn't you? So obviously you've read this before, so you know how we were made in his image. Can you tell me? Mentally, physically, and spiritually. Does it say that in the verse? No, not specific verse, but yes it does. In but why wouldn't he say it here? Mm -hmm. What does it say here? Here's what's interesting. Notice verse 28. Then God blessed them. 
and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now, let's dissect that. Then God what? Blessed. So the first thing is he blessed. What does that mean? I'm sorry? Favor. Favor. It denotes a special relationship. So number one, the blessing represents a relationship. Okay? Um, where am I here? The, um, the first thing to know is that God did not bless the animals. He did not bless the birds. He did not bless the trees. He didn't bless the flowers. He didn't bless the rocks. He didn't bless the water. He didn't bless the environment or the light. The blessing denotes a relationship, a particular relationship in what God wants to do in that relationship. Uh, and of course, the relationship is denoted between the person giving the blessing and the one receiving it. So this is between who? God and his creation. God and his creation. God and man. All right. Then secondly, it says, God blessed, what's the next word? That's interesting. What does that tell you? More than one. So when it says God created Adam, and he talks about them, we're talking about the plurality of the race. Now that's interesting because we just saw that right here, didn't we? So God is plural. Humanity is plural. You have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You have the husband, the wife, and the children. So to say that we're plural like God doesn't mean male and female, even though it says he made them male and female. That's just how they were plural. What did he tell them to do? Be fruitful. What does that mean? Now we're talking about being in the image of God. This is what we're trying to find out here. And you started to speak. It means to multiply. Increase the race. Um, I'll use God's word. That's what he did. He said he created, didn't he? Okay. What does it mean to create? Make it. Produce something. Produce something. Does it mean out of nothing? Mm -hmm. Now be careful. No. Any of you ever created anything? Mm -hmm. What? Give me an example. I'm sure you... I've made two that I needed. Okay. So you created something different than what it was. And we, we can use that term created in that sense. What did God start with? Nothing. Explain the well. It's dawning. He had the dust of the earth. Well, but he made the dust of the earth. But the universe was without form and void, but that doesn't mean there was nothing there. But where did he get the dust? He created it. So anything you want. He had a voice. <laughs> and out of, with that voice, he made everything. You and I have to start with a thing to make a thing. God didn't have to. Yeah? Okay. I know maybe technicality of words and what they mean. What's the difference in create and make? Oh, if I you go, it. Hmm? I knew you were going to say that. I just said <laughs> You go to verse 26. Then God said, let us make. Everything prior, he had spoken, and it was done. When he made Adam, he made him. When he made Eve, he made her. 
didn't say created out of no and made well, there Eve, spots. right? There was like, there are spots. We're coming to that. Okay. Hang on to that because that's very important. There are spots where they interchange those words. They do. Yeah. They do. Generally speaking, you want to keep in mind that the create is where God speaks. He makes it out of nothing, generally speaking. But in the... Hmm? But Adam, he didn't. No, Adam, he didn't. He made. But he says he created man, doesn't he? Yes. So, but generally speaking, for our purposes here today, let's just remember that God, the us of, of uh, God kind, said he's going to make us in his image. He blessed us to have a relationship with him. Can God have relationships? He made us to have relationships. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Is God plural? Mm -hmm. He made us plural. Now, at this point, let's start noticing something. Is Satan plural? No. He doesn't have a partner. Do the ones in heaven, angels in heaven, have a partner? No. So here's something that God made us like himself that he didn't even make the angels. What about this one? Can Satan have babies? He can multiply powers. Yeah, power, but he can't multiply the people, can he? He has to do it through us. So here's one reason Satan is angry at you. He's jealous. A second reason. Actually, this one too. Because he lost this relationship entirely. All right, let's go further. He said, be fruitful, multiply. Then what else did he say to do? What does subdue mean? Control. Yeah. Be control. Bible also uses the word dominion. The word dominion has two meanings. It's a territory and it's a position over. Subdue. So the President of the United States... President is his title, his authority. The United States is his territory. Then you put his name on it and you have who, what, and over what territory. So God told us to subdue the earth. Subdue what? That's the territory. So God is saying that he wants us to have control over, to subdue the earth. This is the place of our dominion. Dominion is what we have over the territory. Does Satan, is Satan in charge of anything? No. <laughs> He's not. He didn't have his own place. He doesn't, does he have a place that belongs to him? No. Except for capturing earth, he has none of these. Stole them from us. He tricked us and took them from us. I want to show you something really interesting. This had come up once before. In the Bible when it says, and God created uh, man and so on, the word man, if you, if you look at the Hebrew and they'll put it in English letters, here's how it's written. Hmm. That could be translated as a woman. A dame. There you go. A dame. <laughs> that is the word that is translated that God made man. Adam. There's another verse in the Bible, and I didn't bother to write it down to remember where it is, but it's a little later on in Genesis where it says that God named the man he had made something to that effect, Adam. And then we have a verse here in this chapter that says that Adam called his wife Eve. So God named mankind Adam and the man called his wife Eve. But it's interesting that mankind is Adam. 
Now that's an interesting scenario. Genesis 2, we have the Sabbath in the first three verses, and then talks about the creation of man. Moses goes back and kind of recaps. He says, thus, or in this way, the way I've already explained, uh, the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Before any plant of the field was in the earth, before any herb of the field had grown. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain in the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. So he says, now, before all of that, he says, I'm, I'm backing you up. I'm backing you up in my story. But a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed Adam from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and Adam became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. Now I call Eden a county. I mean, it's a territory. It was a section of the earth. And eastward in that section, he planted a garden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. Is there an Eve yet? No, there's not. And out of the ground, the Lord made every tree of the ground uh, that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden. So we're not backing up saying, now God made Adam and then he made the trees. What he's saying is he made the garden. He put all of these trees in it, all these nice things. And then he's going to describe some other trees. And that's where it was that he put Adam. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now we know full well what that means. Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and it describes these four river heads that this river branches into. Then you get down to verses 10, I'm sorry, 15, and following, then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden. So you can see now that he's just telling parts of the story, not trying to put him in order. He's just trying to help us to see what had happened. So now he's got all this done, and he puts him in the garden to do what? To tend it and keep it. What does it mean to keep? Maintain. What do you think of when you think of tending a garden? Working it, pulling the weeds, putting the soil, pulling the flowers off. Work. But see, part of what you named didn't come till later. Taking the food. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, or Patriarchs and Prophets, describes that vines stood upright, but then they would bow down. And they would hang down and they were to train these like for their bedroom or their living room or whatever. So can you imagine, here's these beautiful grapes, you know, those great big sweet things, and it's growing up here. And they hang down so restful and peaceful. And so you have grass here and you lay down and you sleep and you wake up in the morning and you look up. Ah, oh, I'm hungry. <laughs> just, it's just right there, you know. Then you say, well, I want something else. So you get up and you walk out and here's something else and here's something else. That was the garden home God put him in. How much digging did Adam have to do? There were no weeds. What does maintain mean? To, to I mean, continue this... what you already have. Okay. So like to maintain your car, you're not creating a car. Yeah. You're just maintaining it. You check the oil and you do this, you wash it and, you know, the various things. So he was to keep, take care of what was already there. Okay? Now we'll see something quite different here a little bit later. Okay, so uh, in verse 15, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil 
you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat it, you shall surely die. There's three things here. You want to keep these in mind. Write them down. Three things that happen in that verse. Commanded the man of every tree, of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall eat. So in these verses, he, told, he gave him a job. And there's a black preacher on the radio. He's not an Adventist. I don't know who he was. I wish I could find that sermon again. You know, black people just have something that I'm missing. Mm -hmm. And that is a command of language. I, I envy their ability to paint such beautiful picture words. I envy that, in, you know, in the right way. He says, when God created Adam, he gave him a J-O-B. <laughs> he never said the word job in his entire sermon, but over and over. He had a J-O-B. We had work to do, didn't we? That was the point of man. He had a purpose. And man was supposed to fulfill that purpose. He also told him, that was number one, gave him a J-O-B, told him what to E-A-T. How do you take care of yourself? You're to take care of the garden. How do you take care of yourself? Now there's another part of man, which is relationship with God, the soul. He told him how to take care of that. And what did he tell him to do? This isn't three letters. It's four. It's one of those four-letter words. Obey. So God told him, you can eat of all of this stuff. That's your diet. But I'm telling you, in our relationship together, that tree right there, don't touch it. Because with it, there's a consequence. And the consequence is what? Yeah. Death. Who did God tell that to? Where is Eve? Not there yet. She isn't even there yet. Now, folks, this is significant. I'll just mention briefly, some years back in our denomination, we formed a committee. We had half on one side of the issue, half on the other side of the issue. Obviously, there was no consensus. So the conclusion was, we don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us anything about what women's duties are in relation to the church. I'm telling you the Bible is extremely clear. There's not a doubt in the Bible. And we'll look at some of that as we go along. Verse 20, let's see, 18 to 23. And the Lord God said, now I want you to think about how this is written. The Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. Now what has happened so far in Adam's life? He was created. He was put in the garden. Told what his job was. He was told to what he could eat. And he was told to obey. The Lord God said, it is not good that Adam should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Now he changes subjects. Verse 19. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every bird of the earth, uh, and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them, and whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. Oh, now I know why we went into, why we thought we were changing subjects. We weren't changing subjects at all. God knew, God intentionally created Adam to be in need of a companion. Remember the us back here? Our plurality? So he makes Adam 
Now remember, we've got a full day here. We don't know how early in the morning he made Adam. We don't know how late in the afternoon he made Eve. We don't know. But there was some time here, wasn't there? He parades all of these animals through the Garden of Eden so that he can see them all because maybe they weren't all in there at that time. And Adam names them. And Adam's like, no, wait a minute, God. <clears throat> I noticed the elephants here. I noticed the giraffes. I noticed the raccoons. I, I noticed the birds, the robins, the woodpeckers. I feel like I need some help here, God. I don't think I can handle this all by myself. Did God make a mistake in making Adam? Did God accidentally make him deficient? Not at all. But he needed Adam to recognize his need. Didn't he? It was pretty clear to Adam, I think, at this point that he needed a helpmate. Then in verse 21, and the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam. That is one of those deep sleeps like when you don't wake up when you get cut with a knife. Mm -hmm. And he slept. And I'll just add a few words. And God opened him up and took out part of a rib or a rib and closed up the flesh of it in its place. Do you think Adam had a scar? No. Why not? God does things perfectly, doesn't he? I've worked with different surgeons and some of them leave a bad scar and others you can't really see it. Really exactly. Some know how to do it. Do you think God knows how to do it? And I don't even think he used a scalpel, do you? <laughs> One thing to notice is that it says he took it out of Adam, but it does not state that men have one less room. <laughs> Any of you medical people here? Are any of you medical people? Yeah. Okay. What happens if you take one of the bottom ribs down here or a part of it? What happens? You have one less rib. If you take it, it grows back. It grows back. That is correct. Did you know that? Yeah. In the bottom rib, we call them what? Flying ribs because they're not connected to the sternum? Yeah. Those ribs will grow back. There are people who swear to this day that men have one less rib than the women because God took it out. Did they not look in there? <laughs> what impressed me though when I learned that, and it was only a few years ago that I discovered that these ribs do, if you cut a piece of, they use them all the time for bone marrow stuff. They need a piece of bone. They take it here because it'll grow back. You're not missing anything. You can't take a piece of your leg. Your leg wouldn't work. You don't want to take out a rib up higher because then it wouldn't be connected on each end. That would affect everything. But they can take this one down here and it's like, it's fine. I'll grow back like a starfish. <laughs> so the point is, is that Adam was complete. Eve was complete. But God created one being and it says here, we can read it, <clears throat> then the rib, verse 22, then the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman. Now, it doesn't say he took dust and made it into a man. He formed it, breathed life into it, and it became a living soul. Eve, he takes a part from that living soul and expanded it, if you please, into all the rest. And you say, now how can God do that? Real simple. Really simple. How many of you have children? Okay, you've done it. You've done it. Right? You start with one egg, one cell, and build it into a complete person. Interesting. The concept is there. God had created that concept. So God only created one mankind, one person. And everyone else has come from there. So God had to work the miracle of expanding a rib into a complete person. Then from there on, he takes this two people and he says, now you can do the rest and make more. With what God gave us, we are recreating, reproducing, 
replenishing the earth. This is how Adam said, now this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Then you read the next verse. Therefore, a man shall ha leave his father and be joined to his wife. They shall become one flesh. One flesh scripturally means one human unit. The Father and the Son are one God. Have you heard that before? You have? I wasn't the first one to tell you that. You knew that all along. And a husband and a wife are one human kind, as the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are one God kind. We're not animal kind, we're not bird kind, we're not fish kind, we're human kind, and there's, we were made by the God kind. So there's different kinds. So here we are with all of these parts, aspects, that is how Genesis 1 shows us we were made in His image. The next time somebody asks you or tries to degrade you, don't bother telling them. They're too ignorant to understand. But you know this is who you are. You have traits and characteristics that even angels don't have. Are you important to God? Why do you suppose he did that in the first place? Did he not have enough angels? We are even made lower than angels. That's what it says. But yet at the same time, there's something here that angels don't have. They have this. They don't have this. They don't have this. They don't have this. They don't have this. So God creates an order of beings that is more like himself than perhaps he had ever created before. God wanted more relationship. Isn't that interesting? Fascinating. Even though he knew his experiment was going to fail. And he knew it at the time, didn't he? Mm -hmm. And Ellen White is very clear. Nothing catches God by surprise. Anytime he makes something, he makes the provision to fix it if it fails. When he makes it, at the same time, he makes the provision. Boy, he sure knows how to do things right, doesn't he? All right, so now where are we? In verse 25, here's the sum of the man-woman thing. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Do you have any bad parts? Do you have any naughty parts? Do you have any ashamed parts? But I'll bet you, every one of you, typically I could say this and I'd be right, every one of you were taught otherwise by virtue of neglect and comments. Maybe not directly but by our failure to teach our children and comments we make the way we approach them and their bodies, we teach them there's bad parts. Mm -hmm. You should be ashamed of them. And then we wonder why marriage has a hard time? Serious? So people say, well, you know, I was taught this is dirty and I was taught that was dirty. And then on my wedding day, my mother or my father says, have a good time. What do you mean? You've always told me it was bad and dirty and wrong. And, and, and so now we go into marriage confused, completely confused. And yet, <clears throat> when they sinned, what was the first thing they did? Ah, oh, we're coming to that. There Thanks for taking us into that. <laughs> when sin happened, Wish we had another half hour. <clears throat> when sin happened, 
Um, what did sin do to Adam? First thing it did, he was afraid. So it broke the relationship. Now, I want you to focus here. The, the title of this next section, if you want to put a title on it, is Relationships. The first thing sin did is broke the relationship between God and Adam. God and Adam. I didn't say Eve. Between God and Adam. I'm, I'm mixing you up here because some of the time I've used Adam for Adam and Adam for mankind. Okay, But Adam lost his relationship with God. They sewed fig leaves together. They tried to cover themselves. So when the relationship was broken, it affected how they saw their person. There's a problem, folks. Huge problem. I dare you to leave this room and find a couple that has not struggled severely with their physical relationship together. Find one that hasn't. Dare you. They'd be rare and far between. If you want to follow in the text, in verse 9, this would be chapter 3. So God called who? And that was the man, not the couple. He called Adam because the the word in the King James, and you go back and look it up in the Hebrew, it's thou. What has thou done? Not what have you all done. Singular. It's singular. That's correct. Adam, what have you done? Now, go back to the work. Who was given the, the work to do? There's not one word to tell Eve what to do. Not one single word of what Eve was here for except that she was a help mate. Adam is the only one with the job. Eve, because of being a mate to him and a helper, that is hers also. Through him, that is hers too. She takes on that same responsibility. So we would say it's a patriarchal system. Ooh, that's terrible. That's a nasty thing to say. A lot of people in our society are saying today, even in our church, that's just a horrible thing. Where's the equality? There isn't any. Not here. Not in the way they're looking at it. It's not supposed to be that way. God didn't make it that way. We can come to that later. So he called Adam, didn't call Eve. In verse 12, when Adam goes to explain what he did, <laughs> He starts out, when God says, what have you done? He says, the woman that you gave to me. She gave it to me, and I did what she said. And we're still doing that. Why are women still running the families as much as they are? Because we're right back with Adam and Eve. Now, I'm not putting down women. I'm trying to show you the responsibility that Adam had, and he failed. If God doesn't agree with this, why isn't Jesus the first Eve? I should say the second Eve. But no, he's the second Adam. Because Adam's the one that sinned. Eve didn't. Eve was the tempter. Did Satan sin by eating at the tree? No. No, the no. Bible doesn't say that. Well, I'm confused. I don't want to tie you up. Go right ahead. But I, he did sin. I don't get that. She did. Okay. Who was responsible for the race? She was. Adam. Oh, okay. That's the problem. She's the help mate. Okay. Think of it this way. You're the boss. Mm -hmm. You've got a job. You're the boss. Mm -hmm. And you hire me to be an assistant. And I persuade you to do something. And then the owner of the company comes to you and says, what's going on? You say, well, my assistant said, I put you in charge. He says, fired. I got you. 
If you're going to listen to him, okay. it's your decision. That's the way God made us. Okay? And it gets worse after sin. Okay, so uh, verse 12. Then the man said, the woman whom you gave to me, she gave me, and I did eat. Verse 13. Uh, and the Lord said to the woman, what is this thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me. And of course, you made him. Notice how sin always, Satan always somebody else. And who does Satan always end up blaming? God. Because God made the serpent. God made Eve. So everybody's blaming God. Isn't that interesting? When you find an excuse for sin that means that God did it, you know it's a lie. Now, what happens? <clears throat> if we look at what God says... We'll start with, we're skipping over the devil. We're not going to worry about him for the moment. We're thinking about us. Now remember, I said this section was about relationships, right? So the relationship between God and man was broken. Now in verse 16, to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. Sorrow in bearing the child and sorrow in general. In pain you shall bring forth your children. Your desire shall be for your husband. What does that mean? You remember in the Old Testament many times, and we see it a lot in other countries, you see it less in the United States, but it's still there. We, ha we see it less in the U.S. because of feminism trying to turn women into men. Now, if you think about what we've covered so far, you can see why women are envying the man's position. Satan wants to destroy the relationship between the two. So the best way to do it is to get the, the um, subordinate to try and take the position of the boss, if I can use those terms loosely, the assistant controlling the boss and then get the boss jealous with the assistant, get the boss fired, get the boss to fail to do the job, blah, 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 and just, it goes downhill from there. And then it ends up saying, first of all, it says, your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. That is the same rule, it is the same dominion, as Adam was to have over the animals. That's pathetic. It was a curse, wasn't it? It was a curse. That's not the way God intended the, the family to be. But in a sinful world, that's where we are. And Satan has been trying to destroy that ever since. Then to Adam, he said, now this is gonna be completely different because he was the one in charge. Because you heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree which I commanded you. He's very clear that he didn't just eat of the tree. He heeded the voice of his wife when he knew he shouldn't have. He failed to use good judgment, didn't he? So when your husband makes a judgment that doesn't agree with you as a wife, you know why he's doing it. Because he's responsible to God, and that's the decision he thinks he should make. He says, I have, uh, and have eaten of the tree, which I commanded you, saying, you are not to eat of it. Cursed is the ground. Now he's got to start digging in the ground. In toil shall you eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you and you shall eat of the herb of the field. So now it isn't just grapevines and trees, whether it be nuts and fruits. Now he's got to dig in the dirt to get the food that he needs to survive and be healthy. And God put thistles in there and weeds in there and rocks in there and everything else in there. He says, you want a tough life, you need to remember who you're working for. So you won't forget now because it's not going to be easy. 
till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, to dust you shall return. Now, that leaves us in a pretty sad state of affairs, doesn't it? <clears throat> um, so, may I interject here? Go ahead. So, all these years within this denomination that we have laid the blame on Eve, reality is God never told her right. not to eat of the tree, He told Adam. He might have, but we don't have any record of it. There's no record of that. There's no record of it. From the record we have, we have always blamed her. Mm -hmm. What we're saying is, Adam is responsible. This is why he's the head. Why did Jesus all the time say, I don't do my own will? I do what the Father tells me. That is a very submissive, I mean highly submissive attitude. And here was God in human form doing exactly that. Would it be evil for the wife to do the same when Jesus did it? Did he not give us an example? Mm -hmm. And trouble comes into the family when we don't have this. Now, what am I saying? Am I trying to put women down? No. What I'd really like to do is put this guy on a throne because kings are responsible. And they make a mistake and they can't blame anybody else. The buck stops here. Period. Men will not take responsibility if women take it from them. They can back off and say, well, you know, just like Adam did. Well, Eve told me to. God says, but I didn't tell you that. He says, I told you what to do. You're listening to her. What do you think I told you for? What do you think your job is? What do you think your responsibility is? And you read Ellen White, and you're going to find all kinds of statements where this man is responsible for her spirituality. Mm -hmm. Hannah, you've got some meaning. And, okay. What happens if you're, for instance, you know, my husband's Baptist, so I can't follow things at this point. So, That's like, true. what do you do with that, you know? That's a, <laughs> now we come to the next hour. I know. <laughs> Enter the problem of sin. And this is where it really gets tricky now. And this is why there's so much injunction in the Bible to not marry somebody you're not in agreement with. And I'm not blaming you. That has nothing to do with it. The point is, when we find ourselves here, what do we do? You know, I have no reason to blame anybody for anything. None. Zero. We all have put ourselves in weird situations. Every last one of us. Maybe not that one, but something else. It's about how do we help each other with those situations. You have this situation. Your mother has a different situation. I have a different situation. He has a different situation. We're all different situations. How we relate to each other is purely, should be, to take that person where they are and say, how can I help it? Condemnation serves no purpose but to destroy it yeah. instead of build it. So this creates a scenario where you have to say, in what areas can I? In what areas do I have to maintain this relationship? Because what we're talking about here is when sin entered the world, the relationship with God was cut off, and the relationship between the two was drastically altered. So now, when things go wrong in life, now those relationships also get changed. And the, the way we work them out has to be done in our relationship with God. I remember a story of a woman years ago. I didn't know the woman. 
I wasn't the one who heard the story, but somebody was telling me what happened. This woman got a hold of a book that women should submit to their husbands under all circumstance, period. Christian standpoint. Doesn't matter who he is. She was an Adventist. He was not. He liked to drink. She used to go with him. But she became a Christian. And she fought it. She resisted it. I won't go to the tavern with you anymore. Blah, 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 blah. All of this stuff, you know how that would go. She gets a hold of this book. And she says, wait a minute. This is what God told me to do. God told me that my responsibility is to him. I'm his wife. Boy, it was hard for her to make that decision. But that's what she decided. So the next evening, he says, let's go to the tavern. She says, okay, what time? And he's like, what? He says, what time do you want to go? Because remember, they used to do it all the time. And he says, you really going to go with me? You asked me to. I'm your wife. If this is what you want me to do, I will do it. He got upset. There's no way I'm taking you down there, blah, 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 blah. And he wouldn't take her. She didn't have to say no. She said yes. And she put the burden indirectly back on him. Here's what's interesting. A friend of mine, they all know her, many of you might know her, said to me, I would hate to be a man in this day and age. I said, what do you mean? She says, men don't know what's expected of them. The way women are and the way we are, the way we do things in our society, men don't know where their duties are and their responsibilities. I said, yeah, that's very true. And that is absolutely the truth. So we're being pounded. The, the men in our society are being pounded so much to let women be equal with them, equal here, equal there, equal somewhere else. The men don't know what their duties are anymore. And so many of them back off and let them have them. Now, how in the world can your desire be to him when he doesn't even know what he's there for? How can he take responsibility and treat you properly when you're not allowing him to call the shots? And if he wants to degrade you and you tell him, is this what you want to be married to? Is this what you want me to become? Chances are he's going to change his mind. Yeah. The academy I went to, Wisconsin Academy, years ago, shortly before I got there, they, one of the faculty had done some research. And they said, we want to know, boys, what kind of girls you want to date, what kind of girls you want to marry. They wanted to date these kind, and they wanted to marry these kind. When you put the responsibility on them is the only time they'll take responsibility. And this is where we are in our society, in our church. It's easy for us as men now We've been pushed and shoved every direction, and I'm not trying to defend anybody here. I'm just saying this is the way it is, that men don't know their responsibility, so now the church is impotent, literally impotent. We have destroyed our church in about every way you can conceive. Take all the major things that makes us unique, not our doctrine, but how we should work, why we should work, the kind of work we should do, and we're basically impotent. Pastors get up and they preach their hearts out, give the gospel, water off a duck's back. Why? Because something went wrong in the Garden of Eden, and it's being pushed harder and harder every year. And so we have destroyed humankind, we've destroyed the relationship, so sin destroyed the relationship between God and man, and it destroyed the relationship within the family. What's left? We were made for relationships. That's what all of this is. And all of that was destroyed with sin. And then continuing to tear down and destroy this, or try and make them equal to that, just continues to destroy the relationship that was meant to be so 
fantastically beautiful. I've got to quit. Somebody might squeal on me again like they did last week. And <laughs> the, the, the preacher confronted me with it. <laughs> it was all good. No, there was nothing bad. Let's pray. Dear God in heaven, thank you so much for giving us the creation story. We're pained at the cause of sin, what sin has caused. We live in that. Angels can't understand it. They see it. They can't understand it. But yet within all of this and all the negative that we've looked at this morning, you were prepared for it. And you have more than adequately provided a solution for it. And as we can continue to study in the next weeks, help us to understand that better than we've ever understood it before. Help us to get a hold of it. Help us to start at the first step in the rung of the ladder. And step by step, help us to rebuild the relationships we were to have with our families and with you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The concepts that are there, yeah. and, and they're presented very well too. Mm -hmm. You know, so too. as far as I'm concerned, when it gets right down to the foundations of Christianity, yeah. it starts in Genesis 1 and 2 and 3. Mm -hmm. And you really don't think about it. If, but, if we don't know who we are, yeah. then but, what's it all about? Right, what's the purpose, which is what I think God oh. Aren't you glad God is patient? Yeah. Yes. No, I'm serious. You, you, you think about it. You're patient with little ones. You know it takes X number of years to get to a certain point of yeah. maturity. Mm -hmm. You know, the mind can only understand so much. The body only learns certain things right. and it gains the abilities. It's true with us as adults. Yeah. You know, God doesn't expect us at the age of 20 or 25 or something to know and experience the things that we'll have when we're right. 60. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Let me, let me try and explain something, and you've probably heard this a hundred times, but let's just go over it so that we can kind of isolate where we might go. All right. There was the um, earth, which is body. Then he breathed, and I looked it up. It means to, like, exhale to okay. blow out. Okay. So he blew out or blew into the body life. Okay, so it's kind of like it's kind of like taking an engine and it's sitting there and then you crank it. Okay? And it starts to work. Chatting here. Okay, so he started out with the physical body. Yeah. Put together, made the parts. And then he put the spark of life in it. When you put life in an engine, when it starts running, what can you do with that engine you couldn't do when it wasn't running? Move, you can move. Yeah. It does all kinds of stuff. Runs a generator, makes heat, does all kinds of stuff. All right, so then this, these two added together equals a soul, which means a living, thinking, relationship possible entity. So it's not, in other words, what they're saying is a soul is like, being basically that leaves you or comes right and that's not their their problem is they do not recognize the need of these it's just out there floating around okay. you know they believe that all the souls were created where way back sometime yeah so that when you have a child one of those now finally gets a body All right. So, whereas what it's supposed to be is no, we are physical. Can't right here. We are physical, mental souls. This you could call it spiritual, not spirit, but spiritual. So. 
I made the statement one time to one of my church members here 15 years ago. I said, sometimes I feel like, to some extent, we're just a soul living in a body. He says, Pastor, be careful with that. Yeah. And that is true. He's absolutely right. Because this cannot exist outside of this body. Okay, because the, and then you read Ellen White, and this you'll find in Desire of Ages, you'll find in the book Education. If you do not develop, or to the extent that you develop the physical, that will help you develop the mental, the brain. Well, that makes sense. If I'm not exercising, the blood flow is low in the brain. The oxygen level is low in the brain. The physical development of the body, teaching it, moving around, causes you to improve your balance, your movements, right. which is all controlled by the brain. Mm -hmm. So you're improving, developing the brain, the skills of the brain. Okay. As the brain develops, that's where your spiritual life happens. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. So if you leave any one of the first two out, you've destroyed the third one as well. Uh, the bottom line is, is that we were designed specifically to enjoy a relationship with God that we don't, we know the angels don't have. Right, right. They're servants. Yeah. We're companions. Mm -hmm. In a sense, we are to God what a husband and wife are to each other. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. We would be the wife part. Right. Because we're to be submissive to him. He's the one in charge. He's in control. Yep. Yeah. Now, if you really want to go more into this husband-wife thing, the, the relationship of the husband and the wife is that, yes, he's to be in charge. Mm -hmm. He doesn't get to make excuses. Yeah. 